We'll get started. Thank you. Welcome to the Vermilion Public Library. Um, and Dr. Fadness today is going to talk about the South Dakota uh, being bombed during World War II, which who would have thought? Um, so thank you for coming. And um, as you can see, there's some surveys in front of you. Is this, uh, this program is brought to you by the South Dakota Humanities Council. Um, so if you get the time and you can fill that out before you leave, that would be great. Um, and then those of us joining us on Zoom, um, I did put the link in the chat. So um, thank you so much for coming. Very excited. Thank you, Kendra. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll be sipping on this from time to time if my voice isn't what it used to be. But well, welcome, glad to see you all. Um, just as fun to see Jan and to see meet Jerry and uh, some of the rest of you who I probably know, but uh, delighted to be here. How many of you have written in a hot air balloon? All right, would you do it again? Oh, yeah. Sure. All right. Uh, how many of you would like to? <laughs> okay. Well, there's still time. There's no opportunity, so do it. Uh, <clears throat> I'm. Uh, uh, you should put it on your bucket list if if uh, you haven't done it. Now, for my part, flying. Well, these are slow, right? Yeah. Okay. Maybe. This is the Black Hills. It's really slow. I doing this right? Not work. We tested it. A little glitch here. Yeah. <laughs> Be patient. <laughs> oh, for that now? Oh, okay. Nope. Good now. No, I don't know. What happened? Sorry about that. I think it, it wasn't clicked on for some reason. Oh, okay. So uh, this, <clears throat> the beautiful Black Hills. Uh, how many have been in Black Hills? Oh, all of you. Yeah, yeah. I lived there for uh, 20 years, and now I'm going to move back to Sioux Falls. Uh, I have. Uh, this is a flying the Black Hills with Captain Steve Bauer, who you know of, uh, Anika, and. Um, it feels like, uh, as you know, it feels like the earth is moving away from you when you go up. It's in a fabulous feeling and uh, almost spiritual in a way. Um, <clears throat> well, today I tell you a tale, a tale that is true. It's about a mystery that few people knew, have known about. And it's a delight for me to share this story. Uh, it's about a silent siege from the skies above South Dakota and beyond. And I'm following my notes here, so I stay on track. Um, <clears throat> America was uh, shot. There we go. Uh, 80 years ago, this coming Tuesday, was the bombing of uh, Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. And some of you may remember that. <clears throat> President uh, FDR called it a day of infamy. Um, on the West Coast, blackouts were ordered immediately for fear of an imminent attack by the uh, Japanese airplanes from the uh, Imperial Japanese Empire. And uh, people were told to fill their buckets with sand and uh, in their homes so that they could smother fires in case a bombing took place. And I remember I was about five years old. I remember my mother practicing putting shade, black shades on the on the west window of our farmhouse in Day County, South Dakota. Now it was uh, the War Department told us to do that 
even though, you know, it's pretty a remote chance that we would get bombed by a stray Japanese plane in rural Day County, South Dakota. <clears throat> Uh, we did it, however, because of, I think, more less out of fear and more out of simply patriotism. That's just way what you do in a time of crisis. Well, the cost of this coming war was terrible, as uh, I know it struck my extended family more deeply than many. My first three cousins who were all brothers were killed. They lived three miles from my farm in Day County, and they were they were all killed in the war. You have my first cousin, Ardeen, uh, he, he's on the, uh, on the left. He uh, <clears throat> entered the service 12 days after Pearl Harbor on December 19th, and he served in the Pacific Theater. He was wounded and he was recovering from his wounds when he was flying to, uh, for an RR in Australia, and his plane went down. He was being transferred to a bombing torpedo a bombing squadron when his plane crashed in the Pacific. My second cousin, Navy <clears throat> RM second class Eugene Lamont Herr, uh, he served in the Pacific Theater on the destroyer USS Johnson. In fact, they just have found the USS Johnson. Have you read about that? And uh, they're doing deep sea uh, searches about that particular uh, destroyer that went down. This was struck by the Japanese uh, in the Leyte invasion of the Philippines. In fact, the Battle of Leyte Gulf in the Philippines was one of the most immense uh, sea air battles ever fought in the history of warfare. It lasted from October 22 through 27, 1944. The ship, the SS Johnson, was sunk and Eugene hung on a raft for, for days, some say up to 48 days, and then he drifted away and disappeared. And we got that story back through his, um, those that survived. My third cousin, U.S. Naval Air Force Lieutenant Leroy M. Herr on the right, <clears throat> was killed in a mid-air plane crash while flying over Catalina Island on September 26, 1945. Leroy had just 12 hours of flying left to serve before he was going to be discharged from the Navy. Well, I remember as an eight-year-old boy going with my parents and siblings over to my Aunt Marm and Uncle Albert's farm three miles away. And I remember when the news had come about Leroy, finally the third son now killed <clears throat> with that telegram, this is to inform you. Or, and I still remember my Aunt Marm was a stoic Norwegian lady, hard to express for, our feelings and she, when we went into the farmhouse after she heard the news, she hid behind the door, her bedroom door, so we wouldn't see her cry. I still remember that. And uh, so uh, later, there were three blue stars in my church in Bristol, and those blue stars they turned to gold, which is the way that they did that in those days. Well, my three brother cousins in one family dying in the war reminded me of the five Sullivan brothers. All five of the Sullivan brothers were assigned to the light cruiser USS Juno, and that was sunk during the Battle of Guadalcanal. All five brothers, Joseph, Francis, Albert, Madison, and George were lost. And if you remember that story about the Sullivan brothers, well, the War Department wisely changed the story after the rules after that. Well, even though the war struck my family and other families unmercifully, the battle arena seemed far distant. And, uh, but distant was no longer true. And I tell you a history almost forgotten in this incredible, incredible tale. It began on April 18, 1942, when Colonel Jimmy Doolittle and 16 crew Cruise took off of the uh, in uh, 16 uh, B 25 Mitchell bombers from the USS Carrier Hornet. And Doolittle's destination and his mission was to bomb J uh, Tokyo, Japan, Kobe, Yogosuga, and Osaka, Japan. And they would drop their bombs and then crash land in China when they ran out of fuel. Uh, this map shows the flight plan. And here in the 
first crew of the 16 is Lieutenant Jimmy Doolittle. He's in the middle. And uh, well, along with him is Lieutenant Richard Cole, co-pilot, uh, Henry Potter, Potter, the navigator, uh, Fred Bramer, he was a bombardier, and Paul Leonard was a flight engineer. One of the crew members of the pilot of crew, of, which was number 15 of the 16, is from Balfour, South Dakota. And uh, his name is Captain Gregory Smith. Smith was born in Oldham, South Dakota as a child. And uh, he grew up there and he played football in Oldham. And uh, he was honored in Belfouche when he came home in this photo at the fairgrounds, I believe it was taken. Unfortunately, later after this mission, he's, his plane crashed and uh, he's now buried at Pine Slope Cemetery in Belfouche. Well, <clears throat> the raid was successful. No, not much physical damage was done, but the psychological damage was immense. The Japanese were stunned, they were embarrassed, they were angry. So how would the Japanese now shame get revenge? Well, how would they exact vengeance? Well, Japanese Major General Kasuba concocted a devious plan as a reprisal the Imperial Japanese Empire would launch a fugo attack, F-U-G-O, Fusen Bakanadun. Fusen Bakanadun is what the fugo stood for. The fugo is a firebomb. The firebombs would be launched and delivered at high altitude balloons flying the jet stream from west to east at, east at 20 to 30,000 feet. And its purpose was to instill fear and terror in the United States. Mm -hmm. Japanese Major General Takata would implement the fugal attack. And uh, so uh, about 9,000 balloons were launched. <clears throat> now we're gonna go put that aside for a minute. We're gonna come back to South Dakota and North America. Um, here's some scenarios, three scenarios that happened. A father and a son went fishing one early morning. They were just settling down and they happened to look up and there was a parachute or a floating like object drifting silently by and over the hill. Moments later, a loud explosion crashed through the valley. All the father and son could see was a small trace of smoke. The two raced over to the area to find out about this mysterious incident. They've only found fragments of paper in the now eerie silence of the woods. Two farmers at work in their field were startled and surprised when they heard a, a uh, stay with this slide yet, when they uh, heard a sudden explosion in a nearby field. The noise was followed by a burst of cloud of yellow smoke. And the two farmers cautiously approached the area. They found a small hole in the ground. Metal fragments were scattered about they had no idea how this mysterious object suddenly appeared. Ranchers, third scenario, ranchers were coming over the top of a hill near where they had camped the night before and they discovered a strange object. It was a partially inflated balloon entangled in the scrub brush. It, was, it wasn't this photo, but it was like this. This was in Bly, Oregon, this photo had no bombs. They surmised that somewhere along its journey, it had discharged whatever cargo it may have carried. So now, based on these scenarios in, in, in North America, something sinister was obviously happening. This is what happened in South Dakota on February, excuse me, Friday, March 20th, 1945 at 6.50 p.m. Mountain Time. And I quote uh, this account. A large balloon descended toward the Cheyenne Indian Reservation in South Dakota. The bag was about 32 feet in diameter and made of smooth pliable paper. A metal gas relief valve covered a hole in the bottom from which 
1945 shrouds connected to the envelope with a mass of ballast gear. The silvery breeze, blown gently by a slight northeasterly breeze, landed in tall grass and bounced along until the equipment caught in a washout. And what they found puzzled them. They'd never seen anything like this before. And after considerable discussion, they decided it was a weather balloon of no great importance. Determined that the balloon could still float, they grabbed the shrouds and led the entire contraption back to the ranch. And there, firmly tied to a fence post, the big bag swayed gently through the night hours, end of quote. Now, this wasn't this was this is a, rep, a representation of what they saw. Um, several mysterious incidents occurred throughout South Dakota during the first half of 1945 at Buffalo, Kadoka, Marcus, Wolsey, Red Elm, and Madison, South Dakota. A balloon exploded in the middle of March 1945 in broad daylight in the sky right north of Custer. The Custer incident was witnessed by many, according to a paper which is published in the South Dakota Quarterly in 1979 by Lawrence Lawson. Another balloon sighting was witnessed a few days later. And then one afternoon, a balloon appeared over Belfouche, three to 4,000 feet high. A civilian pilot who saw this sighting, he pursued the object and he made this report as follows, I quote, catching the late afternoon rays of the sun, the balloon appeared in the sky as a perfect silvery sphere, which could be seen only if the observer was in line with the reflection. At times it disappeared in the bluer haze near Piedmont. Even though a squadron of flying fortresses from the local air base, which of course is Ellsworth, passed within a quarter of a mile without noticing it, end of quote. Also quoting from the South Dakota Quarterly, balloons continued to drift over South Dakota. One South Dakotan innocently carried a balloon bomb many miles over bumpy roads in the trunk of his car. And another South Dakotan allowed his children to use a balloon bag, which was the envelope for a dollhouse. He didn't realize the contraption was quite deadly. The charge from one balloon exploded with a dynamite cap by an Army intelligence officer in Rapid City. It tore a hole in the ground of three feet deep and five feet in diameter. And of course, this was what the balloons were designed to do as military weapons. End of quote. Now, a Hugo balloon, and this describes what I'm what I'm going to tell you, was discovered on the ranch of Mrs. Ray Waring, 12 to 14 miles south and one mile east of Ree Heights. This device consisted of a barometer, battery, wiring, blowout plugs, and sandbags. When the balloon fell below 3,000 feet while crossing the Pacific, the barometer would activate the battery, setting off a blowout plug that would in turn release a sandbag. And uh, the balloon losing black, uh, ballast obviously would then rise as it was designed. And after all the sandbags were released, then the bomb was dropped. Mrs. Waring kept the balloon and ballast dropping device for a month. She first called the sheriff. He did nothing about it. She then called Les Pierce of the attorney's office who came and he got it. The Warrings turned this mysterious find over to the state law enforcement officers in the state capitol. It now resides in the State Historical Museum in Pierre, South Dakota, and is on public display. Have any of you seen that in that museum? You have seen that. Yeah. Um, this Hugo display uh, exhibit display uh, reads, uh, well, you can read it. Large hydrogen filled paper balloons that carried in both incendiary and anti personnel bombs were launched from Japan and were carried on a high altitude currents, we now call jet streams, across the Pacific to North America. Um, from <clears throat> November 1944 to July 1945, 287 balloon bombs landed from Alaska to Mexico. Eight or nine actually landed in South Dakota. The Japanese hoped that the bombs would destroy the forest and divert manpower 
from the war effort. Here is a rubberized, well, here is a rubberized silk balloon. There were two kinds of balloon envelopes, rubberized and washi. Washi was a paper envelope derived from the mulberry bushes. Washi was impermeable and very tough. Women and even children in this factory in Japan setting uh, were busy making envelopes by hand. Shown here is a 10 pound incendiary. Shown here is a paper balloon and a ballast dropping device at the bottom of the, uh, of the heading. Uh, there we are. Here's a 33 pound anti-personnel bomb. Uh, the 26 pound incendiary bombs purpose was to start massive forest fires out west. Here's a side view of the apparatus where ballast dropping sandboard, uh, sandbags in order to ascend. A view of the switch box, bottom view of the base. Uh, again, typical fugal system parts on display. This map shows the launching site from Sendai, Japan, in addition to other sites. You see Sendai there on the right. Also launches, uh, were, launches happen from the mainland, Honshu. Now I gave you a figure 287, but these numbers have changed. Uh, this map shows <laughs> 308 balloon incident findings chronicled from November 2044 to August 31st by Bert Weber in his book, The Silent Siege. The, balloon uh, the balloons and their fragments were found in the following sites at Nolan, Hawken County, February 12th, an incendiary bomb explosion happened. At Buffalo, March 6, shroud lines and several fragments of envelope. At Re Heights, March 22nd, a balloon was found. Kadoka, March 26th, numerous small pieces of envelope found. Red Elm, March 30th, balloon dropping apparatus and bomb fragments. Marcus, which is in Meade County, uh, March 31st, bomb fragment found. Wolsey, April 13th, large paper fragment. And Madison, South Dakota, May 26th, unexploded 5K candle type incendiary bombs. So, were there any cas human casualties? Yes, but not in South Dakota. There were six fatalities. The tragedy took place on Gearhart Mountain near Bly, Oregon, May 5th, 1945. It happened on a Saturday morning when uh, Pastor Archie Mitchell and his wife Elsie and five Sunday school students went on a picnic in the woods. One of the children nonchalantly kicked a piece of metal in the underbush. It was a Japanese incendiary bomb hidden in the forest. There was a flash of fire, a blinding light, shrapnel ripped through the bush brush and human bodies and six people were killed. Edward Anger, 13, Jay Gifford, 13, Sherman Shoemaker, 11, Joan Patsky, 13, and Dick Patsy, 14, and the pastor's wife, Elsie. Archie, Archie uh, Mitchell, pastor of the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church, was a distance away, and, and fortunately, he was uninjured in the blast. He was a pastor of the Christian Missionary Alliance Church there in that area. Um, how are we doing for time? We're doing okay, Tendra? Oh, yeah, we got time, yeah. In 2002, uh, a reporter from the Argus Leader by the name of Steve Young I interviewed um, three people. Uh, two were nephews and one was a niece of Elsie who was killed. Their mother was Eva from, I believe, Sioux Falls. And uh, in the interview that Steve Young uh, wrote about, oh, I'll get to that. Uh, he uh, interviewed the, uh, their mother, Eva, and uh, Elsie's sister. And uh, Eva, at the time, was going to make, in 2002, make a pilgrimage back to the mountain country in northwest uh, Oregon, the community of Bly. 
And there Eva would visit, according to Steve Young's interview, the stone monument erected in uh, August 1950 by the Weyerhaeuser Timber Company at the site of the explosion. Here's the article by Steve Young, which he tells about the, the story. And uh, it says here, oops, says here, uh, shattered uh, lives happen here uh, due to this attack. Um, since then, interesting thing happened. One of the nieces was, her name is Vanessa Boy. She's from Sioux Falls. I looked her up and I interviewed her. And she told about from her version as a member of the family that was uh, affected by this explosion. And uh, Vanessa Boy, um, so happened that I gave this presentation at the Ellsworth Air Force Base uh, before the pandemic. And uh, uh, Vanessa Boy and her family were going out to Rapid City to go to a, a sports tournament. And I said, well, I'm gonna do this presentation. Oh, she said, I wanna be there. So I was able to give the presentation then I was able to call upon Vanessa Boy, who was of course uh, the niece of the family that was killed, which made it quite a dramatic uh, presentation at that time. Well, um, and if she were available, I'd, I'd have her come here and share a bit about her knowledge about the family and her aunt Elsie, who was killed in the blast. Um, Japanese fugo balloon bombs undiscovered still exist today. They lurk like rattlesnakes in the grass. One example of a later find happened in, oh, excuse me, I gotta back up here. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, we're okay. Uh, <clears throat> One example of a later find happened in 1983 by Thomas Newcomb near the Lake of the Woods in Oregon. Uh, they're still out there, Dakota too. In October, 2014, a couple of foresters in Lumbee, British Columbia, about 250 miles north of the US border, happened upon a 70 year old Japanese bomb. Uh, there's an, uh, Editor by the name of Lance uh, Lance Nixon, who was with the paper and Pier for a while, and he called me up one day and he, he said, "I think we found something out in Montana," and he sent me a picture of uh, what he had found, and it was uh, it looked like uh, the, the bomb, but it was not. It was some other. So I identified and I said, "No, you didn't find uh, a Japanese uh, relic," but um, and I explained it was something else. Um, so people are aware of and uh, looking, I suppose you could say, are very much aware of um, the fact that they're out there yet. So when you hike the Black Hills, look out. Or you walk the prairies of Brown County. The Japanese propaganda broadcasted great fires. This is what they said to their people, great fires and America populace is in panic. One broadcast said that 500 casualties had resulted from the Fuku boon bombs. Another broadcast raised the figure to 10,000. Several, this is what they said, several million airborne troops were said to be ready to follow the balloons. Millions. Well, none of that happened. As it turned out, Elsie Mitchell and the five Sunday school children nearby or and were the only casualties. And of course, there was no invasion, no panic. South Dakota newspapers followed the War Department's mandate, wisely maintaining self-censorship. When a report surfaced about a mysterious object in the sky or in the grass, they remained silent. So we never knew about this. Now I'm gonna take a pivot slightly to the right on this. Talk about propaganda. The Japanese used propaganda about the balloon attack in North America. So did the Germans. They were using balloons for propaganda during World War II. And uh, this was some Nazi propaganda. 
And this message we got from uh, uh, a young lady, oh, Evangeline Ron, R-A-H-N. She got this from her brother who was in the war and he picked up this propaganda leaflet that was dropped upon the troops. And the message was this, it was old silk balloon that they used. And there is a sample of that in the South Dakota State Museum at Pierre. The message read, how to end the war, do your part to end the war, stop fighting. The tales you tell of the cruelties of the German prison camps are fairy tales. Of course, you may not like being a prisoner of war, but wake up and stop the war. In other words, give up. Well, um, later, we, the United States, would use propaganda balloons for the Cold War. And the balloons were the message which urged citizens in captive countries to seek freedom. One of the propaganda balloon inventors was my former employee and friend, uh, the late Ed Yost. And some of you know Ed Yost. You could have heard of him. <laughs> You've heard of him. And uh, I worked with him in uh, various capacities for about 30 years, so I knew him very well. And uh, Ed Yost, who is the founder of Raven Industry, a co-founder, he's best known for inventing uh, the modern hot air balloons, the father of modern hot air balloons. And I worked with Ed in the late 1970s and early 80s. I was a drafter uh, and uh, we were manufacturing and selling. Oops, there's Ed and myself. And the guy on the right is Joe Tinninger. Joe Tinninger in 1960 uh, set a record of the highest parachute jump at that time. And since has been broken at least a couple of times, but I've gotten to know Joe as well. Um, he's still living by the way. Ed has passed away, but uh, Joe is still living. So I worked with Ed and uh, we manufactured selling a uh, thousand cubic mean, uh, thousand cubic meter helium balloon systems for the for the international balloon races. This was in, in T, South Dakota. And here's my pen, which is a pin of Sky Power, the company that I work with Ed on. Well, earlier from this, in the late 50s, Ed Yules worked for General Mills in Minneapolis. He developed balloon systems that carried propaganda leaflets. The balloons were launched to fly over the Iron Curtain. General Mills subcontracted with Radio Free Europe, uh, distributing millions of propaganda leaflets behind the Iron Curtain from uh, bases in West Germany. Here are the devices that it invented. Whoops. No, that's, those are some balloons that uh, I worked with on again. Those are helium balloons. The Japanese use hydrogen balloons. And of course, hydrogen more volatile than helium. And here's uh, what Ed invented. Uh, in fact, this was, uh, uh, I suppose, secret for a long time. And I happened to get copies. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> no, I'm sure it's out now. Um, the... Uh, in a document from the Mechanical Division of General Mills, this announcement was given to its employees on August 14, 1951, and I quote, tens of thousands of General Mills made balloons are now landing in Czechoslovakia and Poland, carrying messages of hope to peoples behind the Iron Curtain, called pillow balloons. Because of their 54 inch square size, they were developed at a company research laboratories in 49. The balloons made of polyethylene, a substance commonly used in food saver bags. The company is one of two manufacturers making balloons for the Crusade for Freedom, National Committee for Free Europe, sponsoring this project. And that's where they, where they went. Well, was this leaflet propaganda project carried out and dropped by balloon an effective campaign? And I asked Ed Yost about this, and he retorted. He said, work to blankety blank, which was his salty language. Good, and we got the Hungarian revolution. And he said, when they celebrated, when the Hungarians celebrated the 50th anniversary in 2006 of the Hungarian revolution, then Ed jokingly uh, wrote me a note in which he wryly said, I guess they forgot to invite me. <laughs> <laughs> 
So after the modern hot air balloon had been invented by Ed Yost and the Raven Industries team in 1960, the imagination and courage of folks in communist country were ignited. One story that Ed Yost loved to tell is this one. On September 16, 1979, Peter Streislich, a 37-year-old electrician and former East German aircraft mechanic, piloted a homemade balloon out of communist East Germany with his wife, Doris, two children, and good friends, Gunter Witzel, his wife, and four children. They reached 1,000 feet, 8,000 feet. They passed quietly over East German sentries. They passed over attack dogs, watchtowers, and high-voltage electric fences. They flew over landmines and remotely triggered shrapnel guns mounted at leg and midsection and head levels down to safety and freedom in the town of Nahila, West Germany. This was their second try and thankfully a successful escape attempt. Uh, in uh, 1982, Disney film chronicled this amazing escape to freedom in the movie Night Crossing. Maybe some of you see Night Crossing uh, or something you might want to look up. Uh, one more illustration, a second balloon escaped to freedom from the Iron Curtain. Czechoslovakia was attempted by 36 year old, I don't have a picture of him, but uh, here's where an example of what happened to the balloon. Uh, he, big pardon? That happens with balloons. <laughs> That's right, yeah, you know, working for him, work for Raven. Um, the, uh, and his wife and two children, here's how they did it. They sold the balloons Envelope secretly at the Hytra home. The balloon was similar in design to the one of Peter Strikes, having a wooden platform, a propane burner, and lots and lots of luck. They launched from a desolate forest near Australian border. They flew and then landed close to the town of Trustenhofen in eastern Austria. They walked into town. They notified the police of their safe and surprising arrival. So in kind of in conclusion, so the balloon was often used as an instrument of war. You can go back and there's examples that go way back, but also now this, such as the bombing of South Dakota and the entire North American homeland. And there are many, many examples in which this aerostat, this simple balloon served to tell the truth and give people freedom. So not only was it used for war, but also for freedom and uh, for good helping to free minds and spirits from the bonds of oppression. When Steve Bauer and I landed in, uh, on the highway right west of Custer, I, uh, we then said this prayer. It's called the Balloonist Prayer. May the winds welcome you with softness. May the sun bless you with his warm hands. May you fly so high and so well that God joins you in laughter. And may God set you gently back again into the loving arms of Mother Earth. So, any questions? Yes. I'm having trouble understanding back um, when you were talking about the uh, the balloons that went from Japan and, and did they set them all off at once? No. Would they just do one or two at a time and let well, them go? I'm sure as fast as they could in very several sites. At Sendai and other sites yes. on the right. island Honshu, there were several sites, and so they went up at different times. So why did why weren't we uh, the American uh, technologists? Why weren't they able to figure they were coming? Well, it's kind of like we didn't really know <laughs> about the Holocaust either, did we? They didn't have radar. They didn't have. It's really hard to see. There wasn't radar. Well. Not you know, good. There was basic. There was not the long, technology we have today. Of yes, course. I know. There wasn't long not. range radar. Big pardon. There wasn't long range right. radar mm -hmm. like we have today. It's the main difference. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's just hard for me to understand why we couldn't tell that there were they were they were coming. No, we didn't. I know. I and see they, that. It was a mystery, and they all found these uh, examples that I gave here and there. There are many examples like that. People wondered what this was. And, yes. And no, and the communication <laughs> either. And there was a, a, a very definite intention for the authorities to to keep 
the newspapers from Silent. telling about yes. there's some mysterious mysterious thing happening around here, that would put people in a panic. Right. Would right. frighten people. And uh, so I kept it under wraps. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, any other questions? I think the other part of that is too, is that it was in our best interest not to publicize it so that the, the Japanese would do some launches, decide that it wasn't effective. They maybe not even aware that any of them had made it to the mainland and then, then stop the program. Yeah, see, they didn't know for sure what was what land, what oh, success they had. Yes. They didn't know for sure. And so they had to keep sending uh, as a reprisal to Jimmy Doolittle and his mischief that he committed with those 16 uh, B-25 bombers. I think that was part of Ed Young, or Young's uh, article, wasn't it? That, that how it was, the, there was no news. Uh, yes. It was, the news was suppressed in the United States yep. for that purpose. Yep. Well, probably a bigger purpose would have been the press got a hold of it, a lot of people would get it pretty panicked and that was one of the purposes of the balloons. Exactly. That was a good decision. Yep. And there weren't right. massive forest fires out west because they, their propaganda, what they said was happening to their people and their people were <coughs> fooled. So, well, I'm delighted to be here and thank you for your uh, attention and uh, I hope this was an interesting and informative. And um, I give several talks through the South Dakota Humanities, and this is one of them. And I have another talk coming, which is going to be about Jerry's grandfather, Jerry Sorbo. Um, and uh, I have a book coming out about that, but that won't, the book isn't coming out until spring, I'm hoping, anyway, through the History Press. That's another fascinating story about the younger brothers. <laughs> so, uh, Kendra, that's it for me. Thank you. 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 Thank you.